This is the time, this is the place, and this is FC3, Monkey Business, your one-stop shop for everything geeky, and since everything is geeky, if you love it enough, you never know what you're going to get. Well, you're about to find out, because (laughs) this is your host, IMC, and this week, here's what you're going to get. Our look at the classic movie monsters is going to continue this week. It's with Frankenstein's monster. After that, stick around for our upcoming events and our question of the week. Hi. Hello. Hi, Hello. everybody. Hi. As Hello. With, the, with me, as always, the legendary Tanya Metris. Oh, wait. No, wait. Um, I'm not legendary. No. The legendary. <laughs> no, I probably wasn't You're supposed not supposed to, to agree <laughs> with that. You are so dying. <laughs> you can take your best shot there, DM. You've tried already, gelatinous cube. <laughs> oh, that was great. He ran right, right into, into it. it. <laughs> anyway, with me, as always, the legendary Billy DeTore. Hi, Bill. Hi, Chris. How are you? You still have four cats? Still, yes. Good. We had Oliver to do a, didn't get out again? We had to yet. do a roll call check last week. Yeah. So. <laughs> and then the, the lovely co-host, yeah, Tanya Metris. Yeah, keep talking. Hi, honey. <laughs> I'll be talking for the next 45 minutes at the very least, because that's kind of my job. <laughs> producer Sherry is in the house. Hello. Hello, Producer Sherry. How are you today? I am good. How You're well? You? All's good? Yes. We, we have more donuts. We have more donuts. This seems to be a thing. Last week we had donuts. This week we have donuts. Next week, I'm hoping we're going to have donuts next week. Uh, you know, <laughs> we really should have had popcorn in regards to our movie classics. See, you know, that, you're the thought... only one who's really like got a popcorn addiction. No. Hey. No. Oh. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> our baby bouncing monk. Also, yes. popcorn addict. Oh, my God. Yes. Yes. That's you know, funny. I really just wanted to That's stop cute. at the theater when you're, I not even, g- you're not even going to see a movie. You just want to no, get the popcorn. No, I just want to go get the popcorn. Yes. Well, when I came over last week to watch Frankenstein, when we were talking about it today, right. I really s- thought about stopping at like, Regal Grease <laughs> just to ask to get the popcorn right, before. You get the little kettle corn shakers and so you can make popcorn and then just throw the kettle no. corn in. No, it's, it's got to be ultimate butter, that, yes. that buttery topping see, and things my, like that. We're not listening my to wife Su- oh, My wife no. Susan is a kettle corn nut. I do okay. like kettle corn. I but like we, kettle corn. We went to the nope. public market yesterday uh-huh. to pick up our healthy vegetables and, <laughs> and kettle corn. And, kettle corn. And, and wound up with a big bag of kettle corn. So <laughs> yeah. I knew I liked Susan. Yeah. I knew I really liked her. I, I don't like caramel corn. I don't like kettle corn. <laughs> you know, I got to be in the mood for kettle corn. But mm-hmm. it's usually you get me. it at the Lilac Fest. Not me. Oh. And, no, Lana, but, uh, and Lana hates sharing popcorn with me at the theater because I won't let her get it the extra butter. You <laughs> like the extra butter? No. Oh, you, oh no. I do. Okay. So oh, the no. next time when like Captain Marvel comes out in March... When we go, <laughs> you and I will get the big bucket of popcorn to share, and it'll have like 20 layers of popcorn on it, and then we'll go and get it refilled. The amount of snacks I'm going to hide in my, my Captain Marvel messenger bag <laughs> <laughs> when I go to the theater will be yeah. astounding. Well, the the thing is, when I go to have date night with Sean, yeah. or I get the tickets because I have the Cinemark app, Uh huh. so... One ticket a month is free, and uh-huh. then every other ticket is eight ninety nine. Normally, it's eleven seventy five. Uh-huh. So when we went to see Night School a couple days ago, or uh-huh. last week, or whatever it was, it would cost me eight ninety nine, uh-huh. which it, is money you'll never get back. No, <laughs> it cost me eight ninety nine. It was hysterical. I must have it, but it cost Sean like fifteen something for the snacks because I buy the tickets, he buys the snacks. Gotcha. See, you guys should come down to Rome. When we do these, Rome, when we do these ones, shut up. Um, wasn't because, built in a day. Would you stop? Okay, <laughs> I'm done. It's huh? a good song. I'm not gonna talk. Okay. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Screw y'all. Smack him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he might like that. Ow. <laughs> Maybe. We're getting poked. <laughs> no. The reason why you should come to Rome is they has uh, the theater in Rome has uh, if you go before noon, um, it it's five dollar tickets and mm. their and their snacks are really cheap. Mm-hmm. And they have the they have the recliner seats. Oh, Woo-hoo. nice! Awesome. Now, I would like to Love recommend if you're uh, up for more artsy or fartsier movie, mm-hmm. it's the, the, the little? little theater, which uses which pops its own popcorn and uses real butter. Ooh, Ooh it's even better. Real butter. I went to go see the Michael Moore movie last week just so I could get popcorn with real butter. <laughs> Is that <laughs> Fahrenheit eleven nine? Uh, for Fahrenheit eleven nine. Yeah. Now, yeah. now. Way back when, when we'd have like movie night or something at, mm. at home when I was a little kid, my um, dad would make popcorn on the stove 
in a cast iron skillet. Oh my! And and pop it over mm-hmm. the stove. This was before we had the the ceramic cooktop type thing. So it was a uh, um, with oil and things like that, and it would pop up. And then he would throw uh, half a stick of butter, or whatever. In the pan mm-hmm. and let it all melt, and then pour it over, and then pour the popcorn back in the pan, shake it up, pour it back in the bowl, and things like that. So it was like, yeah. oh, that yeah. was like, it was like Friday night getting ready for Star Trek or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. We would, ha- Alana's like, oh, please, please pick me, pick me, <laughs> type thing, because she's like, oh. Because so. uh, we have a wood stove in our barn. Mm-hmm. And Grampy got me one of those. Um, was it the ones that? You pour the kernels in, and then it's got the, you pour oil in, and you sh- you close it. It's got, like, the metal mm-hmm. thing. And then you then as the... They're, uh, they're really for open fires, yeah. but you can use it on top of the wood stove. Yeah, yeah. I, I would make popcorn um, like that. <laughs> we actually happen to have one of those um, popcorn carts at home, but it's not a really big cart, but it's... Yeah. Like one of the ones where you can make the the popcorn, it, where it heats and spins. Doesn't Grampy and have like one of those? Mm. That we, one's Rikers, I but we had one I use it. We, I, I don't know where either it is. we gave it or Gammer gave him one of those. No, we got some air. Poppers. No, it was the hot dog one, the hot dog cart. That so, so now you know all of our deepest, darkest movie watching. Oh secrets. my god, popcorn, popcorn, and then Mike and Ike's. Okay, and yeah, I, I prefer candy. I like Twizzlers. Yeah, yeah. You I remember know, your Twizzler addiction? You we know, we haven't fed that in a while. No, we haven't. I'm working on that. that. I'm working on that because just last weekend was the Naples Grape Fest. Oh yeah, and I know how much you like the, the grape the Twizzlers. Grape Twizzlers. Now are I have a coworker that lives in the Honeyoy area, and I mm-hmm. think she was going down to the the Grape Fest. And I'm like. I need you to get me a thing of the grape Twizzlers for Billy. Yeah. I'm like, Let me I didn't know. know you had a thing. I could have bought you some. They had them at Walmart when I was looking for grape the black Twizzlers? ones. Yeah, I was looking for black ones, and they didn't oh, have I any like, of the black I ones. I like black ones, too. Now, would you eat right. the orange creamsicle ones? Those aren't my favorite. I like red, black, and the grape, really. The red, black, yeah. and the grape ones. Yep. The classic Stop red. Stop it. <laughs> Ew, that's just disgusting. What? So you're sneezing out one of her D10s. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm over here just minding my own business. Thank you very much. Dangling earrings from your nose. So we're going to take a break. <laughs> okay. And when we come back. More popcorn. More popcorn. More classic monster movies. It's Halloween season. And we're on to Frankenstein. So so we're. And, and it's the original 1931 Frankenstein. That's the one I watched. Yes. And so we got when the, we finally got it. We got the appropriate music for it. Is this Buffy the Vampire Slayer? <laughs> I recognize a cello. Well, why would we have Vampire Slayer there, if we're talking about Dr- Frankenstein? I'm just, I'm just thinking though, it's if, if Shakespeare got together with Bram Stoker and they, they Stoker, cello. Stroker, Stoker. <laughs> no, it's not Strokers. It's, 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 all, it's stuck in my head. And that's the way it's going to be forever now. I typed it three times, and I read it once. <laughs> I did fix it, though. Could you imagine that? (laughs) You actually (laughs) typed it as stroker? I did three times. But I fixed it. If, if, um... Is this like all being recorded still while we're... Yeah, (laughs) because we're not really on break. All of our comedy gold is, is, at least this is funny to us. That's all that matters. Oh, there you go. Here it goes. Put the wings! (laughs) Different types who wear a day coat, pants with stripes, or cutaway coat, perfect fits. Dressed up like a million dollar trooper Trying mighty hard to look like Gary Cooper Cooper, Cooper! Come let's mix where Rockefellers walk with sticks Or umbrellas in their mitts (laughs) If people could only see everyone dancing in the studio right now I tell you I'm learning how to tap dance? Yes, you are. That's true. You've been to two classes so far, haven't you? Two or three. Three. So now I have to go back and watch this movie to... I own it. Do you? Yeah. I had to tap dance for a musical. I might be able to rent it for two ninety nine on Google Play. There you go. <laughs> and there we have it. Frankenstein's Frankenstein's creature. 
keep playing, keep playing this. This is good. Has many differences from other popular monsters associated with Halloween. Rather than being based off an ancient legend, religious concept, or historical figure, his origin is rooted solely in literature. Being confined to one book. Despite this, public perception of the creature has changed greatly since the publication of the original novel, leading to wildly different styles and plot lines in its many film adaptations. First published anonymously in 1818, Mary Shelley's book is considered to be the very first science fiction novel and is very different from many of the films later derived from it. Wow. I'm just going to jam out for a little while. I'm loving this. <laughs> you know, what truly is this? It's, a, it's Frankenstein by Edgar Wintergroup. Oh, very nice. You know, it, apart from the book, Mary Shelley is a fascinating individual. I've heard a lot of little anecdotes about her, but I don't think I've really looked into her she so much. She was 18. She was 18 when, when she it, wrote when it? When it was published. Oh, wow. So she started writing it when she was 16. Did I heard, and uh, I don't know if it's urban legend or not, but I heard a story that she was basically hanging out with the other writers. She was hanging out with Percy Shelley, who she eventually married. She was not married to him at the time. Okay. Um, Byron, Lord Byron. Lord Byron, okay. And somebody we mentioned in the last one, uh, John Poldari. Okay. Um, and her sister, who at the time was dating Byron. Okay. Um, and they courting back in the early 1800s. No, no, no. They were they were sleeping together. Oh, but, just it, just it. Yeah, okay. they had a child together. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, Mary's mother was widely considered. Mary Wollstonecraft was widely considered to be the first feminist. Okay. And she wrote many treaties on equal rights for women. I see. Which was crazy when you remember she was writing in the late 1700s. Yeah, I'm getting that. And um, so she was ra- So Mary and her sister were raised. Uh, Claire, I believe her name was, were mm-hmm. raised in an extremely permissive household, and that believed uh... that women were just as equal to men. And she actually went away with Percy Shelley when she was sixteen. So and, you know, of course, ages are different. I mean, a sixteen-year-old mm-hmm. today is definitely not yes. going to be the same as a sixteen-year-old. Yes. Um, you know, back like in the early eighteen like hundreds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but they went away. They were away for. They went away for the summer, and the story is that um, Frankenstein. The ideas for Frankenstein came from there was a bet of who could write the best horror horror story. Okay, and the vampire mm-hmm. by Dr. John Poldari, who we mm-hmm. mentioned in the last one, right? Um, was that was the story he wrote. From that. During this bet. Yeah, that was his so it's one. Like, it's almost like they had this little, their own little private Nano Remo. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, and Shelley and Byron wrote uh, poems, but I can't remember which ones they were. Okay. And then she and Poldari wrote books. Okay. And from her came... Frankenstein. Frankenstein. That's mm-hmm. Frankenstein. There it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Billy, on the trigger there. Loving it. Yeah. Um, so... It's it's remarkable when you think about it because she was a, a young person writing in an era that does not normally see literature of this type, and she crafted what would become almost a cornerstone of a genre, mm-hmm. and and so and it's endured. Now that original book, have you have you ever read the original yes. Frankenstein itself? How so was has it? Monk. So has Monk. I have not. I had to do it for school. Okay. Um, it was actually quite good. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's, I, I is it a long it read? Immensely. Is it a? It's not no. terribly. It's not okay. bad. It's a short gothic novel. Uh huh. Um, it's and creepy. It's very creepy, and it's but it's I wouldn't I would definitely consider it sci-fi, not horror. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because of the dealings of science. Yes. Involving mm-hmm. in it, and unlike most of the film adaptations, the monster, who by the way is not Frankenstein, Frankenstein is the doctor. <laughs> Right. I know that's the biggest misconception ever. Yeah. yeah. But um, the monster is actually ins- incredibly intelligent. Okay. And In well book. spoken. And, and he's he's not the green that a lot of people picture no, him. He's, he was, he's he's yellow. Gl- he's he he looks like a corpse. Jaundiced. Yeah. Ja- yeah. Okay. He's green and gray and well he's mm-hmm. gray and yellow and just doesn't look real healthy. Um, uh, he doesn't turn to violence until basically after he's brought to life. Uh, spoilers. 
like they don't know the story of Frankenstein. <laughs> it's only a two hundred year old book. Um, when he after he yeah, seriously br- after he is brought to life, which okay, all the um, the movies where it, it's the he's big, alive. He, it's, yeah, the big huge um, laboratory and the light. None of that's in the book. No, okay. no, no. no it was, it's basically in a darkened room. That was the spectacle he's like, for the he movie. He doesn't want people to find out that he's doing this. Yes. Right. Well, <clears throat> Because you're playing with the principles of life and nature, so yes. 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 You'd be plus he was plus he was and... stealing corpses. Um, <laughs> so that's not and, that, and that was frowned people on. People are even stealing back brains too. Yeah. The, the um, funny thing was, was he still had great teeth and hair. Yes, he even did though have... he looked. Yes, he, he had good teeth and hair. He had great teeth and hair. Yes, he did. <laughs> um, but after he creates him, after he comes to life, Frankenstein gets scared. Mm-hmm. It's almost like he never expected it to work, so he runs away and he leaves his creation. Alone. Oh, goody. Who has just woken up and now he, th- what he considers to be his father, he calls him father uh-huh. yeah, throughout I, I, the rest I, I of the story, um, in, in has just completely turned his back on him. Uh-huh. And we also have to remember Dr. Frankenstein is only like in his early 20s. He's a very young man. He's okay. still in school gotcha. at this time. Um, so he runs away and because he can't deal with it. And. The monster, the creature, who has no name, though at one point he does say he should be called Adam. Right. But though it is mm-hmm. not his, it is not it is not actually a name. The creature calls says I should be your, I should be called Adam because mm-hmm. I am the first of my kind. Right. Um, he tries to interact with others, tries mm-hmm. his best to interact with others, and is shunned mm-hmm. and treated like a monster. So okay. basically, he says, "Okay, I'm not going to find what I need in this world." So he returns to Victor mm-hmm. and says, you need to create a mate for me. You need to create someone like me so I am not alone. If you're not going to be the one to be with me, you need to make someone like me. Gotcha. And that's how the Bride of Frankenstein comes around. That's the, eventually the movie, yes. But okay. that is the whole thing. That okay. is the whole story. It's it's mm-hmm. this creature's Need. Longing, longing for okay. companionship is what causes all of the the violence and the horror. Is mm-hmm. most of the horror is done to him, not from him. Now, do you find that this really translates to the movie? No, I, no. I saw. I like listening. I'm just like that's yeah, not. It's not what I saw. Story, I don't no. remember seeing that aspect. <laughs> I, I do want to touch real quick on the movie in the the big how you know last week we were talking about with Dracula how these movies were. Adaptations of plays, they were they were very screen stage, stage screen oriented. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like I pointed out last week with Dracula, you know, at the beginning of Frankenstein, somebody actually comes out through a curtain and addresses the audience, yeah. you know, without looking at the camera. They, they're looking down at the audience, as it were. And so you have this, this holdover to <clears throat> the early days of, of cinema, in essence, and how, the, how it feels. And, and how it looks and how it sounds and, and you, know, you can almost smell the grease paint, you know, when, when they're kind of going through the early blocking. Um, so, you know, the book that you were just describing, I don't remember seeing that in no. the movie. There is a version. Yes, and I've seen it. We watched there it There is class. a version. Um, I'm trying to remember which one it was. Of this movie uh, or of a different Mary Shelley's movie? Frankenstein. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Frankenstein from 1994. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember who was in it. Um, was that Kenneth Branagh? I yes, think so. It was yes. He directed yeah. it, and it was. Um, oh my god, he was I, good. That's it's a very faithful retelling of the story, so but it Robert did Duvall? really bad. Yes, that's what Robert Duvall. I plays saw it the at the creature. theater. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it didn't do well. It didn't do because it was too authentic. Probably. Probably. It probably. wasn't flashy enough. Yeah. Hollywood sucks. Yeah. Anyway. But yes. Yeah, so and but what I find interesting is this is Frankenstein, the one we're talking about. It came out the same year. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. It came out after Dracula because actually Bela Lugosi was offered the role uh-huh. of the creature, um, but turned he both he and John Carradine later turned down the role of the creature because no talking parts, no talking, and they didn't want to not talk. Uh, I see. Though they both play and they both played Dracula <laughs> at some point. <laughs> uh, you all right over there? Yeah, I'm just like throwing the mic the microphone <laughs> off and things like that. All so right. never mind. Leave me alone. There's a Star Wars. Um, Connection, mm-hmm. really? David Prowse. David Prowse played, uh, who played, who was inside the Darth Vader suit, played the monster in three films. Really? Yeah. Huh. And then his voice was dubbed over by James Earl Jones. <laughs> I don't, I couldn't see James Earl Jones going uh. with authority. <laughs> with authority. <laughs> that deep resonance. Oh my God, that'd be awesome. 
<laughs> anyway. Um, That's Java. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. And Igor is not an original character. Mm-mm. Nope. Not from That's, the book and that was or funny. the movies. You know, Tanya and I were watching um, Frankenstein the other day, and, and I was like, Where's Igor? Is that, Did he is that supposed to be Igor? Is that, is they, are they calling him Igor? And then, nope. no, it's Fritz. Oh, okay. Yep. Where's Igor? <laughs> Son of Frankenstein. Son of Frankenstein is where Igor shows up. Sequel now, is, is Igor in the book? No. 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 So Igor is a, con- a creation of Hollywood film. In fact, there's not, he doesn't even, he doesn't have an assistant. He really doesn't. Though, in part of the book, he has a friend who's uh-huh. helping him, sort of. Does, and he also has a mentor at some point. Yeah. And but, let me tell you, Fritz was a nimble little hunchback. At least oh in the movie, God, was. God, he was climb the, up there. Cl- he was climbing and that was up a really sharp and, knife too. Yes, it was because <laughs> one swipe and that guy was falling. That was it. <laughs> so, Billy, uh, you know, you're you're our classic monster movie expert. Yes, you know, this has been your thing. You're growing up now. Uh, you know, we're talking about the big three, the classic trilogy this month. You know, Dracula and then Frankenstein today, and then we'll, next man, uh, next man. We're going to talk man? about Wolf Week. Yep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you see where that thought pattern was going? <laughs> Are you turning into a wolf? Chris needs more sleep. Film at eleven. Um, As where's not this, news. <laughs> where's this one rank uh, in your in your personal? Opinion? I like this one a lot. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I, there's the famous scene of the monster with the little girl. Right. That she's throwing pretty referen- things into the water. She's throwing flowers in, and eventually they. Uh, it, he tosses her in, but right. because of the way the movie was edited for the the times. Uh-huh. They just cut from, they don't show mon- the monster throwing her in. So he could have done much worse stuff to her mm-hmm. if you left to your own imagination. Oh, yeah. Boris Karloff wanted the scene removed. He mm-hmm. begged to have the scene removed because he thought it was horrifying. Uh-huh. And they were afraid that the little girl was going to be terrified of him in the costume. Uh-huh. She loved him. Oh, yeah. She just ran right up to him, thought he was the coolest thing ever. Ever. (laughs) As a little kid seeing this, you know, the monster is the scary guy, but when you watch it as a teenager, as a grown up, you realize the undertonings of of Mm -hmm. the monster being sweet, naive, and gentle until pushed. Until pushed, yeah. And I, I. and I, I just sort of like that that the monster over the year, Frankenstein's monster, Dracula, all of them have just sort of, they're sort of the the Mickey Mouse's of the monster world. Mm-hmm. You know, Mickey Mouse represents Walt Disney, mm-hmm. and now they're they're more figureheads, yeah. the monsters for for horror in general, okay. I guess. So like the Mount Rushmore of, yeah. of monster yes, movies. Yes, that's that's it exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think to the point where you got Herman Munster. And, oh well, yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's one of the things about Frankenstein is that a lot of folks who don't delve too deep, they don't understand that Frankenstein's monster, for starters, is the monster. Mm-hmm. Frankenstein's the doctor, like Sherry pointed out. Mm-hmm. But the monster himself was not born and you know suddenly evil and, and wants to destroy and just kill things. He's not a monster per se. He was just an abomination, a creation. Mm-hmm. And he was just trying to fit in. He was trying to belong. He had that longing, that that need to be a part of something, to, to understand what the hell's happening to him. And that whole interaction with the little girl was so amazing because you can see that here's this this creature who for decades, you know, a century now at this point, two centuries as far as the book is concerned, mm-hmm. you know, has horrified people at the mere mention of the name. But if you look at the character itself, this is not an evil, this is not a villain. No, he he was he was innocent, and until he came across another innocent creature who didn't see his yeah physical ugliness and uh-huh. just wanted wanted a friend. To I have do fun. I do want to state that yes, in the movie, I definitely agree with that. In the book, uh huh, he's not really a sympathetic character. Okay, you can feel bad for him. Uh-huh. You can feel bad for his need to belong. But he does horrific things okay. in order to get Victor. He mutilates Victor's brother okay. in order to get Victor to come home because he couldn't find him. Well, Victor's brother had it coming. <laughs> Do you see how Victor's brother was dressed? <laughs> oh, in the, he had in the book? it coming. That's a holy, totally. <laughs> he had it coming. <laughs> that's Chicago. That's yes. it. <laughs> um, he, so he, that's one of the things that his family too. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah he's okay. just he, he he is a horrific figure. He goes to horrific lengths to get what he wants. He's not a hero. Oh, uh-huh. so he not, becomes president. <laughs> 
Uh, he and chases, that's an entirely different story. He chases Victor all over the world. Yeah. Really? Um, which is yeah. one of the reasons that, that the 1994 film was panned was because they tried a little too hard to make him sympathetic. Rather, they were in some ways they were being very, very true to the story. And then in other ways, they were trying to make him almost the hero. Okay. Which Frankenstein's monster is not. He is not a good guy. He is the the problem is is he is a creature without a soul, therefore uh-huh. without a conscience. As far as the the telling of the story. Now, the most recent Frankenstein version I've seen was the one with oh, what's his name? Was it Thomas Jane or was it Aaron? I can't remember the actor's last name. It was Aaron something or other. The guy who played Harvey Dent in uh, the Batman movie. Help me, somebody. I'm not. Familiar. Oh, you guys are killing me right now. It's the one where he's like fighting the angels and demons and stuff like that, and he had oh, the really cool battle axe. That... Is that Frankenstein Unbound? Something. No, like that? it's just Frankenstein oh, or okay. I Frank I Frankenstein. I Frankenstein, twenty fourteen. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's the one. That was the most recent iteration I've seen, and it was just interesting to see how they depicted the character and tried to touch on, and they created him almost as the antihero. Mm-hmm. And that's I'm wondering. That's where I was. I brought that movie up to lead into this particular question. Um, is this the kind of era right now in this current state of cinema that we're used to with superheroes and antiheroes and stuff like that, that we really could pull a Frankenstein right out of out of Mary Shelley's original 200 year old book that people would be more receptive if we do a straight shot right from the book? Because we have Wolverine, we have Deadpool, we have these antiheroes, you know, we have these people who they're, they're not nice they're not gentle. They're not kind. They don't mm. look out for the right. They they have a, an agenda, that mm. kind of a thing. Do you think that, that the time is right for Mary Shelley's book to come to, to light in full power? The problem with that is that in the book, the creature is not the main character. Mm. Okay. Victor no. is the main character. The doctor. It's, it's Victor's story. Uh-huh. They almost never call him doctor. Okay. Because he's a young man. Gotcha. First love going to school he he is the main character Mm -hmm. um and it's how he it's the horror that he's dealing with i see throughout the story Mm -hmm. um i mean one of the main reasons why he decides to help the creature is because when the creature kills his brother right his adopted sister kind of it was a found it was a girl who the, her, his family took in mm-hmm. but that it was always assumed he would marry someday uh-huh. she's blamed for the for deaths. the, for the death oh, wow. of his brother because they were both trapped outside of town overnight and she lived and he died mm-hmm. so he's doing it to actually to protect her not because he feels bad for what the creature's going through it's to protect the woman he loves. Huh. He is the main character. That's the thing. So I can see where you're going, but, but you would have to do it not as a strict adaptation because he's the creature is not the main character. All right. I, the formatting of the book was really cool, too. In what way? Because um, it starts off... I can't... I know there are letters. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I'm jumping yeah. onto yeah. that. Um, the I'm on. Cool. I'm jumping onto that because I'm on NewYorker.com and it's The Strange and Twisted Life of Frankenstein. It's four stories in one, an allegory, a fable, now getting on to yours, an epistolary novel, which is all the letters, and an autobiography. Mm -hmm. A chaos literary fertility that left a young author at pains to explain her hideous progeny. When they um, put the, um, I just, when they did the first theatrical production of Frankenstein Frankenstein in 1823. (laughs) She's even saying it now. Mary Shelley had given birth to four children, had buried three, lost another unnamed baby to a miscarriage so severe that she nearly died of bleeding that stopped only when her husband had her sit on ice. So, and then the monster was listed as a dash. So it's like, it is going back to like her life because she was talking about finding her baby dead and it was yellowed and whatever. And and it's all the pieces. It was a horrific thing. Was, All the pieces of her life and mm-hmm. things like mm-hmm. that. And and she published it anonymously initially. Yeah. For fear of criticism. Now, did she go through all of this? That was from... After she wrote... Because she, she wrote the book when she was like 16, eight, 17 She wrote years. the book in 1818. 1818. And, and, and you're telling me... She was she born was, in 1800. She was born in 1800. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. She had had... She had gone through had all a, of this before she read the, wrote no, the book? Uh, no, not By all... By 1823. Of, okay. Yeah, so yeah. she started going she had, through... Okay. She had one son... And she'd had the miscarriage, mm-hmm. 
And then she had lo- and then she had two more and lost those two. So she wrote the book before her life mm-hmm. happened in this yes. regard. Yeah. So I, I you know. Did they, well, well, she had yeah. the, the, the horrific miscarriage, which right. is what this is based on. I see. Yeah. Okay. So it says here that um, she wild. began writing Frank, Frankenstein, Frankenstein when she was 18, two years after she'd become pregnant with her first child, a baby she did not name. And it says, nurse the baby read she had written in her diary day after day until the 11th day. I woke in the night to give it a suck. It appeared to be sleeping so quietly that I would not wake it. Then in the morning, find my baby dead. With grief at that loss came the fear of a fever from the milk. Her breasts were swollen, inflamed, unsocked. Her sleep, too, grew fevered. Dreamt that my little baby came to life again, that it had only been cold, that we rubbed it before the fire and it lived. She wrote in her diary. And then she's like, awake and find no baby. Yeah. So Damn, that's horrifying. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. There is a movie based on... Is, is it a coming that, out? There, I thought... No, there was a movie called Gothic... Gabrielle Byrne plays Byron, mm-hmm. and um, I don't look. Are you looking that up? Okay. <laughs> because it was an amazing, and it's about that that click, that cluster of people. Yes, it was about that it, that whole thing and where she got the ideas. Okay. Gabriel Byrne as Lord Byron, Julia Julian Sands as yes. Percy Bry- Bicey Shelley, mm-hmm. Natasha Richardson. Natasha Richardson plays Mary, Mary Shelley. Is it the late Natasha. Yeah, okay. it's nineteen eighty six. Yeah, former wife. What? Liam Neeson's late wife. Yes, okay. yes, she was amazing in it. She okay. was amazing in it. It was a, a, an amazing film. Gotcha. I've watched it several times. It's the the. It's it's a little over the top, mm-hmm. but I think for what it's telling, the story it's telling, it needs to be. And there's some really disturbing visuals, which oh, needs to be because this, this is, is where the season it's for those yeah. leading up to her writing Frankenstein. Yeah. The, and, okay. Dr. Poldari's yeah. in it. The competition to write the yeah. horror story at Lake Geneva. Yes, Lake okay. Geneva. Finally figured out the formatting for the book. Okay. Go ahead. Starts off with letters from a captain going how they picked up this weird passenger. Yeah. And it's Victor. And the captain gets the story from Victor. So you hear about it all through Victor's point of view. And then there's small bits within Victor's story that are from the monster's point of view. Oh, okay. So that's so you get three different points of view within the story, and it's really interesting. Hmm. So good. Now, the very first film adaptation of Frankenstein apparently is from 1910. Mm-hmm. The Thomas Edison Company produced a one-reel film. The original negative was apparently destroyed in a fire in 1914, and the movie was thought to be forever lost. But more than 60 years later, Wisconsin film collector... Uh, discovered that his archives included a nitrate print of a rare movie, and the rest is history. And that's a, you said that's available online, Cher? Yes, you that's, can it, definitely you can find, find it out there. You said it was, what, 15 minutes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 15 minutes long. It's very short. So the, it's the only it's, And it's the only film that Thomas Edison ever made. There you go. And there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of movies from the silent film era, and then the film series by Universal Studios, which kind of gave birth to the cheesy movie at, you know theory. I'm thinking because Frankenstein came out in '31, but then Bride of Frankenstein, Son of Frankenstein, The Ghost of Frankenstein, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Woohoo! Some, House, some how, people feel that the Bride of Frankenstein is actually the better film. Okay, yeah, it is. it's not cheesy. It's, it's not, cheesy. not cheesy. No, it's a very good film. It's an excellent movie. Her hairstyle does not throw that that theory no. off. Nope. Okay. Nope. And In then fact, it's and iconic. Then, and then uh, it is. Billy's, uh, one of Billy's favorite movies, Ebb and Costello Meet Frankenstein in 1948. Absolutely. And, and that's a good movie. You're it, saying. It's a very good movie. Com- it's hilarious, but combines scaries. Okay. You get your scaries, you get your laughs. <laughs> and it has Bella Lugosi and. and Who's on first? What's on second? Exactly. I don't know. Who's on third? Frankenstein's in. Abbott! Th- but no, hey, it's, it's it's an excellent movie. Okay. And then the film series by Hammer Film Productions has really got to ratchet up the uh, the cheese, uh, where you have the Curse of Frankenstein, Revenge of Frankenstein, the Evil of Frankenstein, Frankenstein Created Woman. That's one we got to watch. Yeah, it might explain a lot. Um, Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell, and then just keeps on going and going and going. Flesh for Frankenstein. That's amazing. Oh, and that's the the one you were talking about with Robert Duvall, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the film, 1994. Yes. Uh And then uh, I, Frankenstein, 2014. But at some point, loosely based. now it's the monster is referred to as Frankenstein, or that's how many people think. At what point does uh, perception become reality? Never. Never. Okay. (laughs) So I, I watch an anime where they have 
Frankenstein as a character. His first name is Frank and his last name is Stein. They call him uh, Dr. Stein throughout the anime. Nice. And he's he's constantly fighting with madness throughout the entire thing. Like his madness is that he wants to Madness wants, takes control. Takes its toll. That's takes toll. It's That's a totally cool. different movie. Anyway. And he, he's like it's like he, Same concept though. But isn't yes. he creating a monster? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's the same concept. Rocky is in essence Frank Frankenstein's Rocky monster. Is, Rocky and is the think monster. of in the song uh uh, there's a light. Yeah, it's the lightning. And it's overhead at, Fr- at Frankenstein's place. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, that's definitely a Frankenstein story. Right. <laughs> yeah, Rocky Horror it's... Picture Show. In fact, it's considered to be one of the most um, uh, successful yes. Frankenstein adaptations. It bombed at the theater, but, it's, but, but has it's... lived in infamy for its in- for yes. the rest of eternity at this point. Okay, if you're interested in the story of Frankenstein but don't want to read, mm-hmm. because it can be a difficult read. It's 200 years old. The yeah. language is the a little different. Oh, yeah. yeah. um, there's a podcast called Fictional by okay. Jason Weiser, who okay. he Hi, takes, he, re, he retells mm-hmm. um, stories um, that are in the public domain. And one of the ones he did was Frankenstein, and it's an excellent adaptation. Okay. And he just reads, and he just he does very good. He, he he's done a lot of different Call of Cthulhu and interesting, just all kinds of things. But that one in particular is that I remember that one being very very good. Okay, hmm. all right. So we're going to take a quick break. We're going to wrap this one up for the day, and we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we got some events to talk about. We have a question of the week. So from here on in, it's just a matter of Halloween. Creatures, bad stuff, monsters, and things. Bye. Watch Solier. It's good. This is a Frankenstein traffic report. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. That's your Frankenstein traffic report. Beautiful. So we got a whole chunk of events coming up. This is a uh, Halloween weekend is going to be a big weekend for us. Uh, And so we're just going to go through it as quick as we can here. But we're going to start Halloween weekend with FC3 starting October 25th at 7 o'clock at Nightmare Manor, Southtown Plaza, 3333 West Henrietta Road, Rochester, New York, 14623. MMC and Nightmare Manor with special guest Michael Kosky from The Walking Dead. One of our half of the shenanigators are going to be in town. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tickets are $20 at the door. Donations of children's books or school supplies accepted. To walk through with directors of Mighty Monkey Corporation and Michael Kosky. Proceeds of the evening are going to go to MMC Education Programs. And please note that no discounts or coupons will apply to this special event. So that will be October 25th at the Nightmare Manor, which Tanya was saying last week, this could be the is last. This is their last year. This is the last Nightmare Manor. Yes, so I, that's on their website that this is Go their out last with a bang. Mm-hmm. You know, so join. Come uh, scare Chris. Come scare Chris. Well, no, Chris might be in the play at this. You know, I, I think I'm going to be right there because you know, since Greg French is not in town, somebody has to be the other shenanigator. You're right. So go, go walk through and scare Chris. Yeah, okay. That might happen. All right, more startling, and startling Chris is a bad plan. Mm, I won't be there to do it. Sorry. All right, the very next day, October 26th from 7 to 11, limit, limited number of tickets available for tasting and trivia at Knox Craft Cocktails and Comfort Foods. Again, Michael Kosky, we're going to be keeping him busy that weekend. Mm-hmm. That's how we keep him out of trouble. Tickets are $35 Badly. and include He's a drink voucher, light food tastings, and an evening of trivia. That will be at... Knox Craft Cocktails and Comfort Foods at the Village Gate Mall, our usual living room over there. So that's the 26th, 25th, Nightmare Manor, 26th at Knox. What are we doing 27th and 28th, Tanya? We are going to be adopting kittens from Lollipop Farm at the Greek <laughs> Resort. Oh, wait. No! <laughs> oh, wait. For wait, Billy. That, that's Billy. No. Flower <laughs> City <laughs> Mini. Uh, we are probably going to be posted right near the Lollipop Farm. As we Farm always are. Things in We're the in theater, the theater wing. wing, typically. But it is Flower City uh, Mini Con. Exhibitors, vendors, and artists. Tables for that weekend are only $75. So please contact Brian at, Brian at fc3roc.org if you are interested, and we will keep Billy out of Lollipop Farm. Yeah, that's 
Honestly, according to Sherry, that might be the safe weekend for me because I really want a new black cat, but I guess they won't give me a black cat. Yeah, Halloween weekend, they typically for Halloween. Not. And that'll yeah. be both the 27th and 28th. Michael will probably be. There is talk about um, racing on those stuffed animals. Oh, the, that the we stuffed did with the Power scooters? Rangers in right. February nice. or March. So. I see Michael just tooling around the entire mall with it. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have enough quarters for that. <laughs> but he's looking forward to coming up again. So you, dear listener, our favorite listener, uh, would you like to be a part of FC3 Monkey Business and the Mighty Monkey Corporation? Well, we've got a few ways of doing that. This is the business time. The first way to do it is become a sponsor. We have sponsorship levels of all kinds, and we're even willing to create custom sponsorship packets. So please contact us at sponsorships at fc3roc.org. The next way of joining us in the fun is by supporting us on Patreon. Please con- uh, check us out at patreon.com backslash fc3roc. All membership levels will include access to the Patreon-only blog, plus tons of great perks at all levels. Want to help others find the show? I would love it if you did. Please leave us a review wherever you listen to us. You can find us on Apple Podcast, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, Podbean, YouTube, Stitcher, and if you're especially nice to us, we may even let you into the studio and you can watch it firsthand happening right there in front of you. <laughs> Is there a place you find your podcast you can't find FC3 Monkey Business? Let us know and we'll see about fixing that up for you. And please, 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 please follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at FC3MB Podcast. And if you do follow us, say hi. We love it when you say hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. You know, that Uh-oh. is one of the uh, levels what? on Patreon. It yes, is, isn't it? It is. Is getting to pick the topic and hang out. I wonder yes. who would be the first person to, to do that. I would say James Irish would James, probably be J- one, one, I, one of the ones. James has even hinted that he's thinking yeah, about doing it. So. Too. I triple dog dare him. Uh oh. Uh oh. See, that's a Christmas movie kind of reference. So we're in Halloween right now. So hang on to that for a couple months' time. Uh. All right. So we're going to jump into the question of the week and we're going to wrap this particular podcast up for the day. Billy. Yes. What single work of fiction do you wish everyone would read and why? See, I think that's all very subjective, especially yes. in fiction. Uh-huh. Exactly. I, I, I have favorites. Uh, Three particular favorite works of fiction. I didn't want to go the comic book graphic route novel or or way. I wanted to go actual novel novel. Okay. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Nice. The Stand Mm -hmm. by Stephen Mm -hmm. King. Mm -hmm. Uh, The World According to Garp by John Irving, which is a favorite. And actually, the one I I really wish people would read is Wicked by uh, Gregory Maguire. Okay. Because everybody thinks it's a... uh, a light, fluffy Broadway musical, and it's mm-hmm. not. And it's Ooh. it's a political masterpiece. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And I, I wish more people would read the actual novel of Wicked. And while you're doing that, I'll be over here defying gravity. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you do look like a... Uh, uh, and Dina Med- Alpha Med- Dina <laughs> And Alpha, Abby Delzim Alpha. or whatever the hell John Travolta called her. Yeah. <laughs> I love a Dina Menzel. <laughs> she is awesome. I really love her. She is awesome. Hey, Monk. How about you, darling? What single work of fiction do you wish everyone would read and why? <laughs> <laughs> nice. I, I have a hard time picking. Uh-huh. Um, I, you can pick a book. Just don't pick your nose. You can pick a friend's book. Just don't pick your friend's nose. <laughs> just don't pick your friend's book, I guess. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> you just said she could. I just, I'm a contradiction wrapped in an enigma. Apparently. Surrounded, Surrounded by, by a, a taco. <laughs> Surrounded by a taco. <laughs> In a Baja. Um, Do we need to come back to you? I, no, I, I particularly like uh, a bunch of Mercedes Lackey's trilogies. Okay, so why do you think people should read the Valdemar books? Uh, the, the vast characters. They've got, uh, they've got people that come from abusive backgrounds. They've got people that are gay. They've got... It's just fun. I love the storytelling, too. <laughs> yes. It's a good book she's, and a statement. She's, she's, she's very, very vers- versatile. Yep. <laughs> Miss Sherry. Um, uh, the one that I think, uh, well, I love all of Mercedes Lackey's books. Um, the one that I think everyone should read is Lamb by Christopher Moore. Okay. Um, the, the full title is Lamb, uh, the uh, Gospel According to Biff 
<laughs> Jesus Christ's childhood friend. Right. I think I remember he- talking about this book once before, or at yes. least a reference to it. Well, when we when we talked to Christopher. Yes. Yes. Um, I think it's an amazing book. Um, he's funny, mm-hmm. and he's both reverent and irreverent at the same time. Okay. Um, he, I, I never, at, at no time do I feel he is being disrespectful mm-hmm. to people who follow the teachings of Christ. Okay. Um, I, it's basically the story of Christ's childhood and what was going on during all the years. We don't know where he was. Oh, that's, you know, there's always somebody who's going to have an opinion on that. Yes. And in the book, he goes to search out the three wise men. Really? Yes. Does he find him? Yes, he does. Spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> no, it's a it's a tremendous book. Okay. It's, it's a tremendous book. Um, I learned a lot. I mean, he obviously knew his stuff. He mm-hmm. knew his religion. He knew his stories. Um, he didn't just do from the Bible. There's a lot of other books that are not part of the Bible proper that I do know enough about them to know that he researched into those. Mm-hmm. It's just, they're really, really excellent. It's a really excellent book. And I highly recommend it. Very cool. Tanya. Yes. Do you have an answer for this question of the week? Actually, I do. I um, was thinking about it. I am not going towards like um, novels or books. I'm going uh-huh. more into like the short stories because I've always been a okay. short story fan. And uh-huh. being um, an English major, and I was an English teacher for a couple of years, and um, now I'm a special ed teacher and. Um, every so often, there's a couple that I really, really enjoy. One's an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge Okay. by uh, Ambrose Bierce. Mm-hmm. That was a great Twilight Zone episode. Yeah, and you know, what I like Which about... Which wasn't filmed for Twilight Zone. What What I like about this is, I mean, it, it it's um, American Civil War. Um, the, uh, the main character is a supporter of the Confederacy um, that he... Um, ends up being like a traitor and gets caught and is being prepared for execution um, in Alabama. And he he escapes. The rope breaks. He's able to swim down the river and things like that and, and escape his death or so he thinks. Uh-huh. And it's it's like gives you all the the. Um, imagery and stuff surrounding it and how it possibly could be. But it's. That it's just saying that there's no romance or glory in war, but this, I mean, he was trying to escape and getting back to his wife, and that was his whole whole thing. And then come to find out he truly, spoilers, he truly is hung at the oh. Creek Bridge, but he believes that he has escaped. And it was everything racing through his head. His at, and the ah, last thing. And the last and, thing before he and finally And it was passed. truly, like the third part, it's like he imagined it in, during the time that falling through the bridge and the noose breaking his neck. Mm-hmm. But I all that's such a, an amazing concept that that's I've seen that done in other things. And I think that's such just an incredible yeah, and w- framing twist. technique. Yeah. Yeah. And so therefore, what I usually do, like when I was teaching this particular story is I would take that third like part of that third section off. I mm-hmm. would take the ending off and have the students write the, the rest of the ending mm-hmm. as if they did if they didn't know that he truly dies or whatever and say what happens and it kind of gets the, to their their creative juices flowing so that's one of them and then another one i like is the lottery oh wow oh. <laughs> that's a rough story and lamb to the slaughter you like the dark stuff don't you? i, I do kind of like that, that but you look. don't like black mirror it depends on what it is it, it truly depends on Certain things of Black Mirror I liked, <laughs> yeah. but not, I don't but know. But that framing technique, isn't that what, that what The Last Temptation of Christ was? Potentially, I don't know. That was, it was... I him, never watched the movie. I, I know there's a controversy around it. I know well, the movie Well, because it was, oh, because Christ got married and he did these things. And you find out it's basically all the, th- all the what-ifs that went through his head as he was hanging on the cross. Ah, if he had made mm. other choices. It was the last temptation. Ah, I gotcha, And gotcha. he was basically given this vision of this is what your life could be. If could you have been. Ju- if you just lay it down right now, mm-hmm. this is what your life can be, and he chooses to stay on the cross. Mm-hmm. So it's, I, I don't know why people get so upset about it, because I think it's a, just an amazing concept. <laughs> um, for someone who likes uh, short stories, have you ever read Chivalry by Neil Gaiman? No. It, the first sentence is, Mrs. Whitaker found the Holy Grail. It was under a fur coat. 
which really? is, I think, one of the best first lines of any story ever. It's about a woman who finds a um, finds the Holy Grail in a thrift store. <laughs> and it's not like she doesn't know. She knows exactly what it is. She knows it's, it, oh, it's the Holy Grail. And the next thing she knows, Galahad's at her door wanting it. And she's like, no, but it looks so nice on oh, my, my mantle. mantle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's no, you can't have it. I'm sorry. It goes with my cigar. It's an awesome story. It was I've, the beacon in its grail-shaped naughty suit. <laughs> I have changed my whole decor to go around this grail. You can't have it. But it literally it was. Because it would it fit in my house. It. Yeah. it would look on. It, it would, would fit with your decor. Yes, Absolutely. it would. Yeah. So yeah, I'm like I'm a and I'm also like um like the cask of Amontillado and uh, oh yeah, and you're, the you're Telltale into Heart. Stuff. I'm the definitely classics. a Edgar Allan Poe. Though fan. it's funny for Edgar Allan Poe, I my favorites are two of his lesser known stories. Which ones? I love uh, uh, the Murders at Rue Morgue, mm-hmm. which is considered to be the first detective story. Okay, and I love um, Hop Frog. Mm. I haven't. I haven't heard of that one. I don't think. Um, it's about a jester. Okay, who's a midget. He's a dwarf, actually, huh. and um, is treated awfully and mm. what he does. I see. And it's an amazing story, but it's really creepy. And it's okay. got a well, it's po. really mm-hmm. creepy ending. That's Poe. Yeah. No, and I was mentioning Edgar Allan Poe mm-hmm. last week to you when we were getting ready to watch um, Frankenstein and Dracula. It gave me like a whole sense of um, watching the um, film version of The Fall of the House of Usher. Yeah. So it was like the same aspect that I got. So, well, I've got two also. Mm-hmm. The first uh, is Nightfall by Isaac Asimov. It was a, uh, a science fiction novelette that he wrote in 1941. It was one of his first published pieces, I believe, if I remember my uh, my trivia on Asimov correctly. Uh, long before he published uh, Foundation, uh, it's it's in essence it's about. A planet where it's always in sunshine because of the way that it's it's in a system with multiple suns, but because of a confluence of events, the planet is going to go into the dark is going to go into darkness into a night for the first time in like millennia, and so you have this the citizenry who is used to nothing but twenty four hour sunshine, and so it's 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 a lot of people are treating it like end of the world. Some are treating it like a, a chance to learn. It's it's how you see society dealing with. In essence, kind of a sort of an apocalypse, and and I just I remember reading it when I was in college and just being completely fascinated by it. Um, Is it dystopian? Not really okay. dystopian. It's it's more of <laughs> of a social commentary. <laughs> okay, yeah. using using a science fiction angle to to make commentary on it. Um, and then the other book that I would strongly urge people to read is a simple little novel called The Fellowship of the Ring. Mm. By by uh, uh, a very little known author from England called J R R Tolkien. Oh, are you? Is this a poke at me? No, this is not a poke <laughs> at you. I, I recommend. I've read some of them. I've I, here's the thing: is I've read this book on a couple of occasions, and it's it's tough read. It's long. It's a long read, but it offers so much vision into. For, for we we have come into an era where people love to play D and D, and they love fantasy, and they love the Lord of the Rings movies that Peter Jackson made. To read where it all came from, I think, would offer a great sense of enlightenment for the for what I call the casual fan, the movie fan, the, the D&D player who takes their references from everything they've heard, stuff like that. Read the book. It's thick. It's hard. It's, it's tough sometimes. The language is, is challenging at times, but you get a sense of just how much of a genius Tolkien was, how deep the man's intellect went as he created... This world and these cultures and these races and these visions and these situations, I think you would benefit from just how how amazing and how how expansive this imagination is. So those are my two recommendations: Nightfall by Asimov and Fellowship of the Ring by Tolkien. And then he called a mountain Mount Doom. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, and I, I, I know that I came up with this question, and I keep bringing up more stuff, and I'm sorry, but. Based on things that you said and based on things that you said, uh-huh. um, I want to recommend two short stories if you have not read them. Okay. Um, the first one being There Will Come Soft Rains by Ray Bradbury. Okay. Which is... That's a great name. An amazing... I mean, I would be very shocked if once you started reading <laughs> you didn't go, oh my God, yeah, I've read this. Because mm-hmm. it's very popular in high schools. 
Um, and it's an amazing sci-fi short story with the twist at the end is just mind boggling. And then another one that breaks me every time I read it and I reread it all the time. And it was by Ursula K. Le Guin. And it's called Those Who, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. I've never heard of that one before. It is not. It is a really tough read. Mm -hmm. Just because of the subject matter, but it's an important read. Okay. And it's basically a commentary on what would you be willing to put up with? What horrors would you allow to happen in order for to have a utopia? Hmm. Is there anything, is, is there no price too high? It's an interesting commentary on today's society, too. It really is, and yeah. I highly recommend it. It's uh, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas by mm -hmm. Ursula K. Le Guin. Both of these stories can be found online she in their entirety. She just recently passed away, didn't she? she? I have it right here. <laughs> it's it's long. It's, 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 this so if you start is seven pages now, you, long. If yeah. you start reading it by now, now, you should have it done by next week's recording. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not that long. <laughs> okay. But no, I highly recommend And you like short stories, and... It's and she's one, she was one of my absolute favorite um, fantasy writers. She was one of my she was one of the first fantasy writers I ever read. Her and J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit mm -hmm. <laughs> were the first fantasy books. Gotcha. The Wizard of Earth, the Sea, and that. So. Sorry, I had to put those in because no, that's it good. Just made me think of those. So there we are, another week of monkey business. How are we doing on time, Billy? We are doing really good on time. Um, actually, uh, it's about fifty. 56 minutes. Nice. We're, we're, we're there right being where careful, we wanted to be. Being careful right where we wanted to be. So we're going to go ahead and wrap it up for this week. And next week we're going to bring our, <laughs> our, our flea collars out because we're going to talk about wolves and dogs and stuff like that. I have a very cute uh, uh, wolf man uh, zombie baby. And this has been <laughs> Monkey wait. Business. And you can't wait to talk about it. Yeah, he's cute. Product of the Mighty Monkey Corporation. Friends and family. Join us on Facebook. Follow us on Patreon. Join us on Twitter. Join us wherever we go. And we will lead you to where the entertainment is. We love you. We miss you. We want to see you next week. Have a great one. Dun, dun. Dun, dun.